So, hello, hello, and uh, welcome back from this uh, break after the outstanding previous session also where we uh, learned a lot of things. Just one detail, Professor Xavier is not here, about Amazon to say that the Azores are an ex exception because most of the items do not ship directly to the Azores. So, we're out of that category, all right? And uh, our next session, which is... Uh, devoted to the theme, Stopping the Flood of Plastic, and it's supported by WWF. Uh, we have as a moderator, Nicola Koschel, who is a sustainable tourism consultant uh, working with GSTC. In fact, as a GSTC trainer, uh, we were together these last two days, and is also a WWF representative at Global Sustainable Tourism Council. So, Nicola, I think I'll pass the words for you, and you can present the uh, panelists, but also the keynote speaker that we have today. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Hello. Good afternoon to everyone. I hope you're not too sleepy. <laughs> I hope you're still awake after a full day of interesting discussions and presentations, because I would consider this as the most important panel. <laughs> so, welcome to our panel, Stopping the Flood of Plastic. I would like to welcome my panel. Hello, everyone. I will introduce you in a bit. First of all, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Martina. Martina from Michhausen. She's the Director of Sustainable Tourism at the WWF, and she will give us an inside view of the big topic of plastic waste pollution in our oceans. Welcome, Martina. The stage is yours. I, I use this, or can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Nicola, for your kind uh, introduction. We are very glad to get here the opportunity by GSTC to talk and discuss with you and our group of experts about the very important issue of plastic waste and plastic pollution in our oceans and the environment. I think the number of you here uh, is very interested in this issue and you are probably all very concerned about uh, visible impacts of plastic pollution and I want to tell you, you are not the only one. 87% of the EU citizens are very concerned about this issue. And uh, um, the, the survey done in, in the year 2017, it was the highest rate ever amongst any, any EU surveys for any kind of subject. So at least in this point, there is a kind of consensus in, in, a, in the EU. Um, we have a global emergency case. There is too much plastic litter in the sea. In 2016, plastic production reached 396 million tons a year. This is the most recent year for which data is available on this issue. So this is an equivalent of 53 kilograms of plastic for each person on the planet. And Additionally to that, the production of this plastic in 2016 resulted in about 2 billion tons of carbon dioxide emissions, which accounts almost 6% of the year's total global carbon dioxide emissions. So um, we have to say that plastic is not inherently bad. It's a, um, a very smart invention, a man-made invention that had generated significant benefits to our society, for our society. Unfortunately, the way industries and governments have managed plastic in the past and now, and the way society, that means you and me, are converted in, into a disposable and single-use uh, convenience material has transformed this innovation into a planetary environmental disaster. If you have a look on that chart and you see this number 396 million for the year 2016, um, you, you can imagine or recognize why plastic becomes a disaster. Nearly half of all plastic products which are littering um, the world today 
were created after 2000. So um, the production has grown very rapidly. The issue is only decades old, between 2000 and 2016, and uh, yet over 75% of all this plastic ever produced is already waste. That's the problem. So half of our plastic becomes waste in less than three years. That's the situation. In the Mediterranean countries, for example, which are the world's fourth largest plastic producer, plastic becomes waste less than a year after it was produced. So we are not producing plastic items, which are uh, generating significant uh, benefits, but we are generating uh, waste. Um, what happens to all this plastic waste? Only 63% of waste is collected in a regulated manner. That means it's uh, deposited uh, mainly in landfills, which is not a very ideal situation. And only about 15% worldwide uh, percent is recycled. Due to waste mismanagement, one third of plastic waste is estimated to have entered the nature. So, uh, land, fresh water, and it becomes land, fresh water, and marine pollution. There are currently about 150 million tons of plastic in the seas and oceans, and another 8 million tons are added every year. And this is how we can say um, every minute a truckload of plastic waste makes its way into our old world's ocean. It's quite important to look at the biggest plastic waste producers in the world, which is um, the US, for example, or the EU, or China. But it's also quite important to have a look where plastic waste is mismanaged at the moment. In the Asian Pacific countries, like China and Vietnam, you see it on the, re on the red portions of the, the bubbles, where there is the biggest mis uh, mismanagement. Additionally to that, some of, our, of the plastic waste we are producing from industrial countries is exported to other countries whose waste disposal and recycling structures are even worse than ours. So finally, this waste which is exported um, makes its way to the environment, often through the rivers and then into the ocean. The majority of plastic waste, around 80%, for, is, uh, comes from land, only 20 from, from sea side. So, um, as you know, most plastic are not biodegradable. Uh, depending on the situation and the environmental conditions, um, if they get into the land, stay in land or in the sea, it can therefore take several hundred years for them to decompose. Since more plastic that we learned uh, plastic waste continues to end up in the sea, uh, more and more plastic is accumulating. So, and I stop here now with my introduction about plastic because it's up to you to have your imagination how our oceans will look like if we continue like that. And perhaps in the year 2030, we have more plastic in the ocean than fish. We are here for talking about tourism and plastic. Let's have a look uh, to one of the real tourism hotspots, the Mediterranean, because plastic waste is not only toxic for, the, toxic for the environment, but also for tourism. The Mediterranean countries produce about 24 million tons of plastic waste a year. The same situation like worldwide, there's only 70% 70 70 waste disposed of properly. The rest is not collected at all, and uh, is disposed of illegally sometimes. In open dumps, they throw it away, it's not collected, it's, uh, it's going directly to rivers or, or whatever. This unregulated disposal of plastic waste is the main source of plastic in the environment. So in the Mediterranean, for example, the annual figure is around um, 570,000 tons. It's equivalent to uh, 33,000 uh, plastic bottles thrown in the sea, in the Mediterranean Sea, every minute.
This is why the Mediterranean is becoming a real plastic trap. As you can see that it's a very close sea and every, every plastic waste will stay there for a very long time. And none of the more than 200 million tourists and people who spend their holiday there in the Mediterranean countries and coasts, they don't want to, to swim between plastic bags or lie on dirty beaches. At the same time, we know that tourism plays an important role in the production of plastic waste. Every summer, the seasonal amount of waste in the regional of uh, the Mediterranean Sea increases for about 30% just because of the tourists. To make it more visible, I would like to choose uh, to, to present you a very popular place in the Mediterranean. The Balearic Island, uh, Mallorca in Spain, is hosting um, more than 12 million tourists per year. That's a lot. And uh, as you can see here, the figures is that in the, in the summer peaks, uh, the um, the waste, the plastic waste, is, uh, is ne nearly doubled in the summer months because of the tourism. So Mallorca is really drowning in waste. The government of Mallorca, who's, who's really concerned about this issue, they hired, uh, they, they, char uh, they chartered these so-called trash boats in the summer months to collect the waste and to clean the surface of the water uh, around the island and also to clean the beaches. And they fished almost 15 tons of waste only this July, only in one month. This emergency, and that they say they are only scratching the surface with these activities, um, yeah, unlike many other holiday uh, regions in the Mediterranean that share the similar fate, Mallorca is now taking, for example, a radical action to combat the plastic waste pollution of the Balearic Islands. And they really uh, passed a law against uh, banning single-use plastic um, a little bit one step ahead of the EU directive, which did nearly the same thing. So what they did is they, uh, they really say, okay, there will be... Uh, there will be a ban for a lot of products which are found on the, the, on the beaches of Mallorca, which will be forbidden um, from 2020 and 2021 onwards. This is a very radical um, reaction, but uh, the government was so desperate that they see that this is the only solution for the, for the island to keep their rep reputation, to keep the, the environment uh, in a proper way. Other destinations um, are still sticked in, in structures which are not changing very quickly. For example, the island of Sakintos, which is a Greek island, and the most important nesting place for the Kareta Kareta um, turtle, uh, the worldwide most important place, they, in the summer months, cannot cope with the waste left behind uh, by tourists. As you can see, the waste is uh, increasing two and a half times more than in, in normal days when, when there is less uh, tourism. And it looks like this. I don't know how you, uh, when you spend your holidays on some creek islands, you see pictures like this when the, the infrastructure and the, um, the, uh, the management of the islands are not able to, yeah, to, get, to get rid of this, uh, of this waste. And it's, uh, it's really a, a problem for all these places. In addition to a better waste management in the respective regions, measures are urgently needed in the hotel and the tourism industry to reduce these waste volumes. So getting rid of any kind of single-use plastic and packaging and products is important because less plastic used in these regions means less plastic thrown away. And what, uh, for example, a colleague from uh, another NGO uh, in Mallorca said, when all the plastic is reduced, that will not end up in the sea. As a result, the industry can contribute alleviating the problem of inadequate disposal structures and make a direct and concrete contribution to combating uh, the marine pollution. So if the destination is not able to change and or changes very slowly, it's up to the responsibility of the industry 
to get rid of all this plastic waste. There's no other solution because they can't wait until there are more investments in infrastructure. It takes much too long. So it's up to them to take the responsibility. But many hotels have reached a dead end by replacing single-use plastics with disposable products made of other materials because it is associated with the belief that other materials, such as paper or wood, are inherently more environmentally friendly uh, than plastic. But that's not really a solution, because it's not uh, solving the waste problems and the pollution. There's often insufficient knowledge about the actual impacts of these materials on nature and the environment. So replacement is not the answer for the problem. WWF supports activities around the world that reduce the amount of plastic waste that ends up in the environment. The first priority should be to avoid and then to reduce packaging. So please consider our latest report. We have a report on the effective measures to avoid uh, plastics in the hotel sector, which was la launched uh, yesterday. And we have uh, a lot of other um, very good reports about the Mediterranean area, what the policy can do, and what, uh, what are the strategic approaches to, uh, to, get, to solve the problem. I think that a five-star holiday means today waste-free landscapes, clean beaches, and healthy beaches, and healthy oceans, sorry and not plastic-wrapped amenities offered by the hotels. So and now we can discuss with our, our expert round about this uh, issue with you. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Martina. That is very alarming. Every minute, the equivalent of one truckload of plastic in our ocean. I would say this is very alarming. Um, good to have you on stage. If someone has further questions for Martina afterwards. So let's see who else joined our panel. I would like to first welcome Rachel McCaffrey. She's a consultant from the UK and she's co-founder of Travel Without Plastic. They are supporting the travel hospitality industry in reducing the amount of single-use plastic. Hello, good to have you, Rachel. The second, hello, this is Christian. Christian from Wikinger Reisen in Germany, uh, a family-run business specialized in hiking and trekking and nature, na nature experiences. They have recently announced to offer a plastic-free tour. So let's see what Christian Schröder is going to tell us, what the efforts are of a tour operator to reduce or eliminate plastics. Tui has come very far. Welcome, Tui. She's from WWF. Vietnam and she's gonna represent or tell us about a destination that is heavily heavily affected by plastic waste She's gonna tell us her story from Phu Quoc in Vietnam Last but not least, Pai Min Lin. Hello Pai Min. Pai Min is, came here. She's from the Travel uh, Coral Association uh, in Taiwan and she tells us about a local stakeholder initiative, a, some, a, bit, a bit smaller scale, but a very nice initiative that local stakeholders have started to raise awareness for the issue of single-use plastics. Welcome, Paimin, nice to have you. So we will start, we will start with Rachel. Rachel, we have heard from Martina how big the influence is of the tourism industry on the plastic waste issue, so we are not just suffering from it, we are also contributing to it. And in the last month, we have read a lot of nice stories of hotels banning plastic straws to save the oceans. That's uh, nice, but that is obviously not a solution to the issue. So I would like to know from Rachel, why is the industry not taking real steps to eliminate single-use plastics from its operations? Is it working now? Yes, I think it is. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, there are things the industry is doing, um, and so IHG's announcement earlier this year uh, about removing toiletries from the, uh, the 843,000 guest rooms they have around the world will save 200 million plastic bottles in, in a couple of years. 
Then those are big sweeping gestures, gestures um, and there are other um, hotels that have made an announcement about straws and, and uh, Ibira Star as well, taking all the single-use plastic out of their rooms. So there is some work going on. There's not enough. We know from, from our own personal experiences of sitting on beaches in Europe and elsewhere that it's not enough. Um, and I've certainly been on beaches that it's, it's felt like sitting on a rubbish tip. Um, and I also remember not feeling like that 20 years ago, sitting on beaches. Um, I, I'm disappointed that this session isn't a, isn't a wider session because I think this subject is really important in, uh, in tourism because there is such a direct link between our actions and hotels' actions and the customer experience and the, the experience we offer visitors to destinations. It's um, the plastics issue is such a visible manifestation of what we're doing as a species to the world. It really is something I feel should be you know, more prominent. So I'm glad we've got this session anyway. In terms of why hotels are not doing more, uh, there is um, lack of, of knowledge. Not lack of knowledge about the problem anymore. I think everybody recognizes the problem. Um, but lack of uh, uh, knowledge about the solutions uh, and where to start, uh, lack, of, um, lack of understanding of, uh, of where to start and, and uh, kind of feeling slightly overwhelmed by the problem. Some businesses think that uh, uh, it's going to be very expensive to transition um, and uh, uh, actually many studies have shown that it, there can be many cost savings from reducing plastic in hotels. So a study that the Travel Foundation did in uh, Cyprus in 2011 actually of five hotels that uh, reduced plastic over five months by an average of some hotels it was only about 20%, other hotels, uh, sorry, some hotels only about 10%, other hotels who were really engaged reduced by up to 70%. Uh, but the average saving across those 20 hotels that were involved in this study was 111,000 euros, sorry, collective saving. So there are real opportunities for saving money as well. The other thing that I wanted to say about barriers holding hotels back and businesses back, uh, and I think this will be familiar to you, is its habit, its laziness and its habit that oh, we, we order these because we've always ordered them. Um, I, I stupidly forgot my toothbrush. I have a very nice bamboo toothbrush and I forgot my toothbrush. When I got to the hotel last night, they had one for me behind the, uh, the counter when I asked uh, and it was a, a plastic toothbrush. No surprise there, but with a little plastic cap over the, over the bristles. It came in a plastic sachet and it had uh, toothpaste, which I didn't need in a plastic tube with it. Now, it takes somebody to think, this product isn't right anymore. We shouldn't be ordering these anymore. But, but people don't do that. And it, it needs that kind of wake up. First of all, do you need to be providing toothbrushes? If I've forgotten my toothbrush, do you know what? The hotel, I shouldn't expect the hotel to give me a free one. They shouldn't be doing that anymore. Um, but where they do, it should be a more sustainable material. Or, they, you know, why not make a charge and, uh, uh, and, and uh, get people to donate to a marine cleanup charity for... Uh, for providing products like that. Um, so there are many barriers, uh, but I think people are really recognizing the, the demand that consumers have and hotel staff themselves to see something different. Uh, so it's, it's really thinking about things, looking at the opportunities and, um, and getting out of the habit. We shouldn't keep doing the same things we've always done just because we've always done them. And one, one more thing, um, Rachel, we always hear hotels saying, but the customers want it. They want these little, little things in the hotels because there is demand for it. So I'm wondering, is that, is that really true? Is, are the guests demanding these single-use small items, whether it's shampoo or some other amenities in the hotel rooms? I think it's interesting if, um, if you're lucky enough to go and stay at a really exclusive hotel, you know, a really kind of boutique hotel, you don't see very much plastic. It's not, something, it's not something consumers associate now with quality. It's not, um, you know, maybe kind of 20 years ago, but uh, the, the really upmarket hotels have cottoned onto this and really cut down the amount of plastic that's visible to guests. Um, I think it's also true, I kind of liken it to uh, cheese and crackers on aeroplanes. There was a time when whenever you uh, got on a flight, you'd have a the standard meal on a tray and there'd always be cheese and crackers there. 
uh, and uh, it was something every airline felt that they needed to provide. Um, one of the airlines I work for, Virgin Atlantic, just quietly took the cheese and crackers away. Nobody noticed, nobody complained. Other airlines have done the same thing. It's very rare that you do see cheese and crackers now. And actually, it's, it was something that was just always provided because people thought, oh, we need to provide this for customer satisfaction. But they really, you know, they, they barely noticed it. Uh, an example that I, I gave when um, I spoke to, uh, to Nicola in planning this session was a, uh, a hotel in, uh, uh, in the Balearic Islands that we work with uh, to... Um, they needed to keep toiletries in the rooms as part of, sorry, they needed to, keep, to provide toiletries uh, as part of the star rating system, but they didn't necessarily need to provide them in the room. So what we said was, just make them available uh, on reception. Um, uh, 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 if people go and ask for them, just put a note in the room to say they're available on request. And uh, uh, this was a, a standard kind of package hotel, as I say, in the Balearics, um, seven, 14 nights, days. People took their own. So in that season, uh, that whole summer season, not a single person went down uh, and asked for these amenities. And that was 20,000 bottles that they would normally get through in a year, 20,000 bottles of toiletries, 5,000 euro it saved the hotel. So a really fantastic, um, uh, fantastic way of saving money and of really showing that customer expectations have changed. Now, people at a conference like this, we come to a conference and... We don't want to see water in plastic bottles. I used to come to, to sustainability conferences all the time and get frustrated. We're talking about sustainability. Why is there plastic bottles on the, you know, on the table? But there are other products now. Um, another, I brought some little props with me uh, for companies that go, uh, that have tours. There are these fantastic filter bottles. If you've got one of these, you never need to buy another bottle of water again because they filter even water from a muddy puddle. There are things like... Um, Plastic bags made of cassava, you know, practically so kind of biodegradable you could eat it. Uh, <laughs> uh, straws that don't, um, you know, they don't melt when they go into liquids. Um, but to, uh, to also uh, reference the, the comment that was made in the, in the presentation by Martina, there are other products and things like this wooden coma are, are an example that actually, what benefit does that give to customers? Is it really something we need to provide anymore? Rather than just replacing, should we just get rid of the combs altogether and, and customers can work out their own way of, of getting tangles out of their hair? Thank you so much. Christian, the hotels might be resistant, but the guests are not. And I think everybody, all of us, we have seen plastic, whether it's on a tourism hotspot or on a deserted island or in the Pacific coast, it doesn't matter. Um, and as Martina just said, 87% of EU citizens said that this plastic problem is, the, according to them, the biggest problem we are facing at the moment, the biggest environmental problem. So how do you meet the demand of your customers? What, how do you react? Because you might get some feedback because you have critical customers, people that want to enjoy nature. Exactly. Um, when people travel with Viking Horizon, as you said in the introduction, we are into hiking tourism. They expect unspoiled nature. They expect intact nature, beautiful environment. You find that in many, many places in this world, but it's getting less. I was starting out about 25 years ago as a tour guide, and um, as soon as we left the high tour spots and we got out into nature, um, it became really nice. And this is changing more and more. I mean, you see plastic on the hiking passes, um, you see rubbish more and more, and uh, this is really becoming a problem because our clients are asking us, why are we taking this pass? Why are we taking this hike? Um, you are supposed to show us the most beautiful places, and you show us rubbish. And then we have to explain to them, hey, hmm, yeah, it's getting more difficult. I mean, we can take uh, other hiking passes, but they might look the same. It's not everywhere, but it's increasing. So we said we have to start, but we are a small um, tour operator. So what can we do? And um, I was um, very critical in the beginning about this idea to start. I mean, we have only 70,000 clients. Sounds, for us, it's a lot, but uh, 
if you compare with the huge companies, it's not, it's not a lot. It's, it's a small, small group of people, actually. But um, then, because we had to start somewhere, we, we started in, in South Africa. We have a worldwide program, and in South Africa, we have about, um, around about 3,000 customers. And we decided to put um, water drinking, drinking water tanks into our buses. And we asked the people, we asked our clients to take their own bottles, their reusable bottles, to bring them from Germany to South Africa and then take them back so they don't have to buy plastic bottles um, in the stores. So, you know, these are these one half liter bottles. At least you need three of them during a hiking day, one and a half liter at least. So you need three bottles. Now, you can count that by yourself. We have about 3,000 clients in South Africa. The average um, tour is 20 days, and um, every one of them um, needs one and a half liters, three bottles. So we estimate that um, it will be 200,000 plastic bottles less within one year. And when I heard this number, I thought, hey, we can do something. We really can do something. So we did something similar in um, Thailand. In Thailand, you probably know that wherever you go to a shop, everything is packed in plastic. They give you these little plastic bags. So we provided our clients with, um, with, with cloth bags made of um, material which has been recycled. And we asked them, when you go to a shop, you um, ask the people to put the item into the bag. So we estimated that we have um, about, around about 60,000 plastic bags less. And we're talking, when we're talking about Wikinger, about a small company. And we can actually do more than expected. Now you don't want, you want to hear about this plastic-free tour, <laughs> okay? Um, this was actually an idea in uh, combination or in cooperation with WWF. Um, we found a hotel in Germany at the Baltic Sea, which is absolutely plastic-free. So they have their own water. Um, they have no plastic in, in the entire hotel. There is no, um, um, there's no toiletry, there's no uh, prepacked toiletries, there's no prepacked items on the um, on the uh, buffet, on doing breakfast. And um, so this is one very, very big asset and um, Rachel just told us that um, the hotel is very, very important. So all we had to do is to make sure that um, the clients don't um, use plastic on their ways. We're asking them to bring their reusable bottles from home so they get the water and tea from the hotel and um, then it comes to a very, very important point. This is the tour guide. The tour guide, which knows the area, which knows the, um, the shops and, and all the amenities, um, looked for shops and prepared the shops. There will some people come. They don't want to have plastic items. So we really could bring that into action and bring that into reality, the first plastic-free tour of the King Horizon in cooperation with WWF. Thank you so much, Christian. We are now switching to the destination level. As I said before, a destination that is heavily affected by plastic waste. We are talking about Phu Quoc, the biggest island of Vietnam. And um, Phu Quoc, on Phu Quoc, the tourism industry is like the main economic driver. It's the biggest economic force, and it could therefore also act as lobbying force for this issue. And I would like to hear from you, Tui, what, are, what radical actions are needed to save your island from drowning in plastic? Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about uh, our island and also WWF's work there to reduce the plastic. Uh, first of all, you can have some imagination that the, the island is about 500 uh, kilometers, uh, square kilometer and about 120,000 local people. 
But the tourist is about 2.5 million, 2, 2 million a year in 2018. And the local government, they even aim to 5 million in the next few years. Well, first they, uh, they target 2020, but um, I think that, that will, that not going to be. And um, the total weight on this island, is solid weight, is about uh, 150 to 180 tons a day, of which is 30 tons uh, plastic weight. Uh, that's according to our uh, research in the last year, uh, in June last year. And uh, among those uh, 30 tons, only one third are collected. One third, the other one third go to the dumping site. Dumping site, not landfill. And then one third go to the nature. So you can ma imagine how the, 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 the island is. And well, actually, one of my uh, one of our colleagues uh, going to the island, and we took them to uh, see the dumping site. And when he put his uh, camera to, to take the photo, the camera recognized the uh, the the charts, uh, the dumping site as a mountain. <laughs> yes, that's the case. And in one of the photo over there, you can see that that is one of the local uh, village beach in the monsoon season where the, the wind blow the plastic from the uh, ocean to the, the island. Well, I have to say that the problem is not only from the ocean, but it's from the people and the tourists on the island uh, to prevent the wet, the plastic wet from the ocean. It's rather difficult for us, for the local people, but to prevent the plastic from the local from the island itself is possible. So, um, as I just said earlier, 10 ton is uh, disposal into the nature. We can prevent that. So, we start a project with um, own stakeholder there, uh, with the government, with the participation of the government, the tourism sector, the most important uh, economic sector of the, the island, and also with the local community, including the school children, and uh, of course to the uh, public and the tourists as well. Uh, so uh, here we talk more about tourism. So I would uh, focus more on the hotels and uh, the food and beverage uh, shops on the island. So we, we first start with some hotel who recognize the issue uh, and who, when they, they heard about our project, they kind of uh, very eager and very supportive. So um, we start with them and then we try to influence the other. Um, they have a chamber of uh, hotels and resources on the island. So we, we uh, come to those kind of uh, chamber meeting and talk about the issue, show them how the the, the issue is really is U.S. tourists, when you come to the island, you only see the nice place. You see the beach, you see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the forest with, without plastic because the hotel, they try to prevent the plastic from their beach. The local authority, they try to clean up the, the public area. But if you come to the local village where the, the, the shore is behind the side, everybody and also the, the dumping site which was on the side of one of the main road on the island the local authority they put a fence um, uh, iron fence to prevent the view of the tourists on the, on that uh, uh, road so I think that so that way is not sustainable and the tourism sector they they start to act um, but many of them didn't know where to start from. And uh, so they, they, asked, they, they asked WWF how to support them. Uh, and then, um, well, they also want to uh, uh, marketing what they are doing. So we start with um, single U plastic first. So we say that they can reduce, some of them already done before we start, but some don't know uh, how to do. So we start uh, telling them that maybe you can start from where you can. So they, many of the hotels start with uh, reducing the, the straw 
removing, actually removing, and they replaced by some of the um, uh, bamboo straw. And uh, later on, there's more availability of paper and grass straw. But we, of course, as uh, Martin has analyzed, it's not sustainable, it's not the way. Replacement is not the way. Because uh, not only it's in wet after use, but also it needs some more um, resources of the nature to create those uh, kind of product. Uh, for example, if you want a bamboo straw, you have to grow straw. And you have to take some land to grow that straw. And on the island where the economy, where the tourism is booming, no land for, for such kind of business, uh, much less benefits than hotels or uh, swimming or kind of that. So we think that, uh, we, we told the, the, the hotel, like Rachel had mentioned that, make it available, but not automatically. On the, on the room or on the, the front desk of the restaurant, for example, we can serve, they can serve the food or the drink, but notice, uh, make the notice with the guest that there's straw available if you need, but not automatically provide. And one of the example from, from one hotel with uh, 1,000 room is, they are fully occupied around the year, every day. So one day, uh, at the beginning, they provide, uh, in one room, they provide one or two bottles of uh, plastic, uh, uh, bottle of water. And uh, uh, one year, they provide 400,000 plastic uh, bottles of water. So that is a very big amount. And we talk to them. And they really get into the, the, the idea by calculating how they can reduce. So they, we tell them that, okay, now you don't have option, uh, you don't have uh, uh, option or investment, yet you can provide a big bottle of water, 20 liter, and make it uh, available at the reception so that or some, some play in the hotel so that people can refill their bottle and you provide some of the bottle in, in their room. So uh, they calculate that. After just one year, with, uh, without 400 bottles of water not automatically provided to, to the guest as commentary, they will um, kind of, uh, uh, get the money back from they get the, the investment by setting up some, some kind of uh, water station. Uh, I mean, they can let here the, the real water, the refin water station, not only the big bottle of um, of water at the reception. So that's possible. Uh, the reducing is possible. And um, well, but not always that easy, or not always that the, <laughs> the case. Uh, we talk with some uh, cottage, some, some, some resource. Um, they have uh, two management system, not system, but two manager. They divided the year by two, ta two, two periods. Uh, the first six months is managed by the, 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 the daughter, and the last six months of the year is managed by the parent. Um, of course, that's the Vietnamese owner. The daughter was graduated from abroad, and she well aware about the problem, so she uh, agreed to replace all the single-use plastic and sachet, plastic sachet with the um, paper or another option. But then when the parents come, they say that, no, that is too costly. For example, with the tea, uh, tea sachet, with the paper one, you can keep, uh, they can keep it in our humidity weather for only about a few, few days or one week. But with the plastic sachet, they can keep it for months, for a month. So they calculate that is cost. So they, the parents remove all the... the, the <laughs> The effort that the daughter has been initiated before. So that is some of the example you can see from the, 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 the work with the hotel. And uh, our work when we um, do with the hotel, that um, some of the general manager of the hotel are very supportive, but they, they have uh, some uh, disagreement or kind of 
not a common agreement about the, the topic with the owner because of the cost. So several or quite many number of general manager had left. So we lost our contact and we have to initiate the contact again and again. So yeah, it's possible, but not easy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chewie. Yes. So this is a great and huge approach. Now we're going to switch to a smaller one, to a coral island that is just seven square kilometers big. It, but it has turtles and there is a local initiative that wanted to save these pristine animals and the oceans. And Paimin, please tell us, what, what have you been doing on the island? Uh, okay, everyone. Uh, my name is Paimin from Taiwan. I'm actually originally I'm an artist in the island and I'm doing some uh, creation to support the tourism to uh, attract traveler to visit my home island. Then there are two actions. Of course, we have made a similar problem with other islands, but uh, some we have to do. Uh, we are, I'm going to share about two actions we did uh, quite well. And this is called, uh, okay, I'm going to induce, introduce my home island. It's in the southwest of Taiwan. It takes about 20 minutes from many of Taiwan. So it's quite convenient for traveler to uh, make a trip in short time, maybe two or three days. Then, uh, but uh, is anyone have uh, memorized uh, Martina at the first picture? It's a green turtle. What is doing? It's biting the uh, plastic. Yes. So it's the problem in La Ho in my home island. So we just try to uh, find a way to tell people uh, how the uh, environment is really important to the sea turtle species. And there are several uh, sea turtle species uh, habitats in this island. It's really a special condition. Uh, normally, sea turtle is going around the world, but uh, this kind of turtle is called green turtle. It's actually live there. So it must be a really take care of the uh, environment. So uh, what's the uh, beach money uh, going on? Then uh, the principle is we uh, divide people into several groups and about five to ten people in a team and play as a game like a competition to make it more interesting. Then uh, the member is, can be uh, children from primary school or can be uh, children with their parents or tourists or uh, some local residents. So uh, the award is called uh, is Gaming Beach Money. The major is called on the weight. So the champion will win the five beach money in a tie. Then second one will win four uh, beach money and third one will be three. So uh, we provide 50 uh, beach money for one uh, action. So uh, from, we have done this action for several years, about three for four years, and we have already uh, published 1,500 beach money. Then so, you so, can so that means you do the beach, beach cleanups with the tourists yes. together and the local stakeholders and whoever wins gets these beautiful items, wins these beautiful beach money coins. Yes, yeah. and so this uh, beach money is also created by local artists, and then I'm the one of these. So, um, what I'm going to say, okay. Okay, you can actually uh, bring this beach money to purchase on the local shops. You can buy dream or uh, to buy food or any shops uh, to buy some souvenir 
everywhere. If you can uh, see the sign, uh, which I have bring some sample here, uh, you you can see uh, the sign, the shops they hanging on the door outside. So you can use this to uh, to buy something you like, but. Uh, actually, at the beginning, there's not so many people want to take this beach, beach money to buy something because it's really beautiful and really special, so they want to keep on their own. So we try to make more activity to encourage people yeah, to use them. And also, uh, I got some feedback from the tourism like hotel or restaurant or shops there are so many uh, tourists come to my home island only just for the clean up this, to get this beach money. <laughs> so it kind of joy and then involve people to do more and more. And second one uh, is the, uh, we call eco cup. So it's like a rental in cups. So Taiwan is a tropical uh, island a tropical country, so it's quite warm. So Taiwanese people usually drink a cup of drink, four to five cups a day. So can you imagine if you buy the cups drink in the shop, five cups in a day, and Taiwan has 2,300 uh, population. So can you imagine how much plastic we have made in a day? So we uh, started trying these rental uh, cups and you can rent this cup uh, for free. And then also you can borrow from the shops when you buy drink and you can return in the, another place. It means you can uh, rent uh, in the A point and then return in the B point as your convenience. Then uh, that's a way we try to do, and then it's doing really well. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very inspiring, how you can do something good at a small level. I think that's great. Thank you, Paimin. Rachel, I would like to come back to you. Uh, what do you think are possibilities uh, to put pressure on suppliers and on distributors, on municipalities. Do tourism businesses have the chance to create successful alliances? Do you know of any that have worked and have really made some change? Well, I really think we've got a good opportunity in the, the tourism industry for a success story here. Those of you who were in the room at the last session would have heard Javier Font talking about the carbon emissions from us all being here. and making us all feel quite guilty. Um, there, are, there are some issues, and climate change is one of them, that are really difficult and really, you know, just something we struggle to get our head around as a species. Plastic pollution, especially plastic pollution from tourism, it's pretty simple, really. It's, none of us like it. Even the people who make plastic don't like to see it washed up on beaches. It's, it's really something that we all support and all want to see less of. Our industry, as we've heard from the various presentations, is a significant generator of, of this litter, this plastic rubbish. So we really have the potential for a movement for change if we're one of the contributors to the, to the litter, but we also want to solve the problem. It's a, I think it's a really exciting opportunity for a, for a great success story in tourism. Having said that, as Nicola said, it, it's not something that any one company or one organization can, can do on their own. It really needs people to work together. Um, we have been involved in an initiative uh, funded by GIZ in Laos, um, which is called uh, the, the Plastic Free Laos Project. Um, it's, uh, Laos is, is a little bit like Vietnam, that uh, the, the waste collection, uh, I think in Laos is even worse than Vietnam, it's practically non-existent, but there is Plastic, plastic, plastic churned out and, and uh, it's really, really a big problem. Um, the Plastic Free Lao Initiative is a, a certification scheme that encourages restaurants, cafes uh, uh, and hotels 
to um, stop using 10 commonly used items of single-use plastic to earn this plastic-free LAO certification. And local auditors have been trained to go and visit the premises and uh, uh, check that they're abiding by the, the plastic-free LAO standards. And if they are, then they get a, a certification. Um, and this is promoted to tourists and encouraging tourists to, to visit them. Um, so that's one small example in, uh, uh, in an emerging destination. In, uh, uh, in Europe, um, I was uh, really pleased to be um, involved in the launch of uh, the Plastic Pledge, which is now um, being looked after by um, UNWTO uh, and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And that's again a, uh, a network of, of stakeholders, companies, uh, organizations, individuals that are really interested in this issue and, and really want to see a change, encouraging companies to make a, a commitment towards making tangible changes. Um, I think as an industry, we also have, as, as individuals uh, and as companies, we've, we've got lobbying power. As individuals, it really makes a difference if you, when you're uh, given a, a straw in your drink that you, did not, that you didn't ask for, that you say something. If you, if you think that the premises you stayed at is using too much plastic, feed that back. You know, it's, it's, it's only that feedback, really, that's going to drive change. And likewise, as companies promoting destinations, I stayed in, um, I stayed in the, the, the north of Florida this time last year, uh, north of um, Fort Lauderdale. I stayed on a beach that uh, uh, was so dirty, it felt like sitting on a, on a rubbish tip. And when I went swimming, there, there were plastic forks and, uh, and sanitary products I, I was, you know, seeing next to me as I was swimming. I'll never go there again as a tourist. Yet many British companies, European countries, are selling that as a holiday destination. They need to be talking to the, you know, I need to be feeding back to the holiday companies, but they need to be talking to the, the, the um, tourism authorities and the government bodies in those destinations saying, this is affecting business, you know, that will drive change, that and, and more legislation. So Tui, um, we've just heard from Rachel that alliances can create change. Yes. What alliances or partnerships have you initiated on Fukok? Yes, um, yeah, that is uh, one of the um, chains uh, our project had made into uh, the, the island. Uh, at first, the web issue is there. But the government, um, uh, the local authority there, they, they was kind of didn't uh, uh, think about the, the, the acts from the individual or from the review of, of the plastic uh, of, or wet in general. Um, at that time, when we start the project, uh, they have the local authority, they, they have one investment um, on the wet treatment factory, which uh, hope we will hope to be uh, in function in uh, the few months. But up to now, one and a half year past the deadline, the factory is still not operating yet. And the, every day, nearly 200 tons of wet is continue mounting on the island, on the dumping site. The dumping site was closed and open, closed and open again and again. So they really realized that they need to, to work with us. What we proposed earlier was really a solution they can do right now. And we also bring business, because at the beginning, they didn't support uh, very much our project. So we start our work with the um, uh, hotel, uh, tour operators, and then we make a kind of uh, group uh, of the businesses come to the meeting, we invite uh, businesses uh, to the, our meeting with the government and we talk about the problem, we talk about the effort that the uh, businesses is uh, uh, doing and also businesses uh, raising their voice about the need uh, of uh, this, uh, this is kind of live or debt for their business and also for the island so that the government start realizing that they need to act uh, uh, upon so they start with, uh, they, they, they ask us to help with the uh, uh, first kind of awareness raising uh, activity and then help them to uh, uh, dra draft or um, create the action plan for the island on reducing plastic waste. 
And then uh, they, the, the leader of the island, they, he, he decided that every first Saturday of the month will be the day for the environment of the island. So that um, every, uh, in that Saturday, the whole island uh, locals uh, go out and do the cleanup <coughs> around their living area. Uh, well, maybe uh, I don't have uh, those uh, kind of photos to show here. But um, uh, you can see that in, the, in those days, all of the, uh, both private sector and even the tourists participate in the cleanup and the local people with the uh, border army, the, the, the uh, army force is joining the activity of cleanup and normally uh, the, the tourists or the local people, uh, they just clean up in the um, easy play. But some difficulty play like uh, the uh, river mouth or somewhere in the um, wet stuck, they, they need some, body, some, some, uh, F, some force like uh, the border, like uh, the army force and with the, uh, the, the crane to, to lift up the weight from the the river mouth. So you can see that uh, in that photo, um, um, that a lot of uh, soldier is uh, trying to clean up, to collect the weight from those uh, very dirty area. So that kind, I think that that was uh, both influenced each other from the government and the, the business side. And now the, the, the local government officially announced that they win uh, establish an alliance, uh, a, a public and private partnership for the environment, uh, environment of Phu Quoc, uh, and then they will um, uh, talk to each other and uh, identify which area each uh, one can, can take care of. Yeah, I think that is big uh, movement uh, that now the government and the business sector can talk and can have a common voice on, uh, uh, on issues. I would like to raise one last quick question to Christian, and I would like to invite the audience to put up your questions, please, or upvote others' questions on Slido so that we can go to the Q&As in a second. Christian, you are the sustainability manager of a travel a tour operator. What would be your next step? Cooperation is a very, very big topic and very important topic, and um, I was very happy that you mentioned it. Um, we have our own hotel on the, um, on the island of Tenerife and um, after we yeah, tried to do um, avoidance of plastic and all over the world, we said, okay, we now want to do it in our own hotel, so this is the step we are preparing right now. Um, it's about reduction. I mean, from um, your research, I, I really like this uh, when you say um, reduction first and you're using it and recycling. Um, recycling is pretty difficult um, because the recycling systems are not um, on the same stage everywhere in the world. So I think it's uh, about basically about um, reduction. So we try to do this in our hotel on Tenerife Island that we um, reduce plastic wherever we could. So there also we have uh, drinking tanks where our clients can go and um, bring their own bottles and then they get the water from there of course for free and um, we reduced um, all plastic items on the buffet in the restaurant part and um, of course also in the rooms but now there's one place where we really cannot do anything so far because you say what are you planning to do in the future and um, we were thinking about corporations. When it comes to the kitchen where they deliver the meat, um, this is usually seared in plastic. So I mean I would have loved as a uh, sustainability manager to say we have a plastic free hotel but I can't do that because we still need plastic packed meat, for example, or fruits or something, whatever, in the kitchen. So what can we do about that? We just can talk to other hotels and say, you have the same problem, don't you? So if we all work together, we might get 
into um, the private sector, we find a company who say, okay, we deliver meat and so on in special, special uh, cameras which are plastic free. I mean, these baskets are on the market. It's nobody who has to invent them, they're there. But they just have to be on the island. And the hotel I'm talking about is a small hotel. We only have 40 rooms. So by ourselves, we cannot do that. But when we convince other hotels, when we make our point, then when we work together, we find companies who will provide this part, which is still missing, that we call, can call our hotel um, um, plastic-free hotel. So this is my dream to start with this hotel and um, then we will go step by step to other hotels we're working close together and where we have many clients and say, hey, it's possible, we could do it. You might ask yourself now, but didn't he mention in the beginning that they are working with an absolute plastic free hotel at the Baltic Sea? So it's working, doesn't it? Isn't it? This hotel doesn't have a kitchen. So then it's easy, they only serve breakfast. And, but when you have a kitchen, you get this problem. So I hope we will solve the problem and can spread the word how to do it in the future. And then we might say to our hotel partners, this is something you have to do if you want to be a Wikinger premium partner. Okay, thank you so much. We would like to start with the Q&As. Uh, I see a few very interesting questions. And it could also help if you want to tell us whom you would like to give the answer, if you want to do so. I would like to raise the first question to Rachel, because it's a hotel-related question. Is, the, is paper the answer if a hotel wants to replace plastic? Please give us some more specific advice how to be sustainable. Well, whether paper is the answer. <laughs> whether paper is the answer depends very much on where the paper comes from and where the hotel is located. Sometimes it's the answer, sometimes not. We've been working with hoteliers, as I say, for, for quite a few years now. Um, and one of the things that we've really noticed is that uh, there's a lot of confusion there uh, amongst uh, uh, people who procure for hotels and, and who manage hotels. And um, Martina referred to it in her presentation. There's a lot of mis-selling of, of products as well, particularly the bioplastics, which I get very frustrated about. If you Google, you know, bioplastic cup, uh, on, on Amazon, uh, sorry, or, or, or look on Amazon, for example, the kind of claims made about these products include that they're vegan, that they're organic, that they're compostable, biodegradable, any kind of eco buzzword going. Um, what isn't given is the information often that they have to be uh, collected, sorted, and industrially processed to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be compostable. Um, what we're trying to do, um, and it's in development at the moment, what we're trying to do to, to get over this problem and support hotels is develop a, uh, a website that's it's, um, it's, it's in development at the moment. It's launching in, in uh, Mallorca um, uh, as part of the, uh, uh, the Plastic Free Island project with Futurus. Um, it's a website that... Uh, uh, educates hotels and hotel managers on reduction, first of all, and gives tips on how to eliminate single-use plastic. A lot of the same kind of tips that are in our, uh, in our guide on the, the um, Travel Without Plastic website, but also signpost them towards more sustainable products, because yes, replacement isn't always the answer, but it's a transition. Uh, in the short term, many hotels do want some products, so it's better that they have, have full information about the products they buy. So look out for this, uh, this website, greenerguests.com, uh, that's launching in January, that should signpost hoteliers to, to the more sustainable choices for them. What we want in the end is to have a sustainability rating that's based on their location, that take into account things like the carbon emissions from production, the carbon emissions from transport, the, carbon, the, the land use, the water use, the labour standards. We need more investment for that, so if anybody's got deep pockets, then come and talk to me. But um, this is the way forward, I think. We need to move towards a situation where people have more understanding of the sustainability of the products they buy and the sustainability of the products for their particular situation. 
Okay, I would like to raise the second question, uh, and I would like to ask you, Tui, because it's a destination question. Can tourism businesses do anything to influence plastic consumption or waste habit of the local residents and destinations they visit? My answer is yes. Uh, first, as I said, that the um, uh, voluntary do the beach cleanup or the cleanup in the, the island at the beginning, which later on influenced, of course, with some help, influenced the local government and the local government already issued a decision which asked all the, the people on the island to participate in the beach clean, in the cleanup, uh, island cleanup. So that is one way to raise awareness for people. And as we say that once you do it, you understand more than you just uh, hear about it or thought about it. And then second one is uh, in, in the many hotels we are working with, they have the regulation for their staff who many of them are local people. That they have to reduce the plastic, uh, single-use plastic. For example, not bringing the um, single-use plastic into the hotel. Um, for example, for their breakfast or some shopping. Um, and they have some strict regulation. And even some general manager told, uh, kind of, uh, well, threatened, but not seriously, that they would be uh, uh, chased out of the job if they violate the regulation. So that way that they, they create the, some regulation first, but and then later on it become a habit and become a, a, a practices for the, the local people who work for the hotel and from there influence the community where they live. Yes, thank you. We get the question, when does it come to a point where the government has to regulate the number of tourists and put a limit on it? That is a difficult question. Would you like to give an answer, Rachel? I think that one's bigger than just plastics. Uh, I think that was probably discussed in the over-tourism session. What we need to do is, is make sure that the tourists that are coming are using less plastic. Yes, then, then it's not necessary to have a limit. I think that the tourism can contribute very much and very easy, as uh, Rachel said. And so there, um, the, the limit is probably not necessary, because, perhaps because of other things, but the plastic uh, problem can be solved also with, uh, with a, a lot of tourists when they then they behave or they reduce in a, in a, in a proper way. Do you know a tourist destination that, has, that eff effectively addresses the problem with cigarette filters? I can say something about that. Okay, um, please. I, unfortunately, I don't know a destination, although I know some of the beaches in Italy are really encouraging people to, um, to, to not leave their butts in, on, the, on the beach. But um, I, that's, I think this is one of the major um, sources of plastic pollution worldwide that people are really unaware of. Uh, and it breaks my heart when I see friends smoking and then just stubbing it out on the pavement and forgetting about it. And I'm really torn between just leaving it and going, mm, <laughs> picking it up and telling them off. Um, I heard in Amsterdam, where it's a, a massive problem, that um, uh, the, uh, uh, a single cigarette butt pollutes something like a, a square meter of water or three square meters of water or something. So it really is a problem. Um, I don't know destinations that are really tackling it effectively because we haven't tackled properly the, the visible plastics and, and this is one of the more invisible. And we have a... When a can you put it on Slido, the question? Or, no. Directly for Rachel? Yeah. 
That is great. Thank you for sharing it. <laughs> I would like to uh, to come to that question for Paimin because this is directly addressed to you and it's very interesting to hear who is responsible for collecting and cleaning the returned eco cups. So who covers the cost of it if it's for free to rent them? Who covers the cost for the maintenance? Uh, firstly, it's support from our local government mm -hmm. yeah, to do the six months in a turn. Then after that, we are doing uh, the locally, uh, the local society, and then also include some volunteer. So, uh, yeah, we, we hope it is going well after. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, we have a question about food service, and we talked about it before, not here, but in another session. And because this is a bit difficult issue, the questions in food service when we take out, uh, take out one one-way plastic, it's against HCCP. What shall we do? I think this is again for you, Rachel. When I was talking about the, the barriers to change, that was one that I, I mistakenly left out, that um, health and safety concerns uh, are one of the, the big reasons that um, uh, single-use plastics are used in hotels. These and also um, uh, things like uh, star ratings that demand certain things, also brand standards in, in chain hotels. It, it may be a, a brand standard in, a, in an Ibis hotel, for example, that a, a pair of plastic slippers is in the room, that a, a plastic pen is in the room, that certain items are there. Um, and I'd say the same thing about these star ratings, these brand standards and the, the health and safety legislation, um, or the health and the safety rulings. They need to, they need to be more tuned in to how we need to live more sustainably. So they need to, to um, uh, particularly the brand standards and the star ratings need to be modernized. Uh, in terms of the health and safety, I would say that yes, that's not an area we can compromise, but um, it's, it's true that there is over caution in some cases. There are also other ways things can be done. It's sometimes used as an excuse to say, oh, we can't do it differently because health and safety, mm, not possible. I absolutely accept in some reasons that's true. But in other areas, it's used as an excuse, and then there are other methods that can be used. Um, this is an interesting question, because we, we have the same problem, actually, when I go to a hotel and uh, the Mediterranean and um, ask them to reduce plastic, then they say, oh, no, this is against health regulations. And I was very happy when I read your research by WWF, because I was asking them this question, say, please find out find out are there really these regulations and what they told us the experts is no not at the mediterranean maybe the one who asked the question is not from the mediterranean sea and outside the Medi mediterranean sea there might be these laws but not at the mediterranean sea there is one example is italy Italy is a little bit problematic because um some say yes some say no so they they still don't know how to interpret their uh, laws but as far as we know, and as far as the research brought out, there are no laws against um, reducing or um, reducing plastic. Um, there's another interesting one. How can we enforce policies such as carry in, carry out? It's not on the screen. I don't know why it's not on the screen, sorry. How can we enforce policies such as carry in, carry out? What is carry in, carry out? Do you take away? I would say carry plastic in, you have to carry it out again. Oh. Um, <laughs> well, so yes. What we can do, we can ask our clients to do so. And, and we do that. We, uh, in the booking information, we ask them to bring these reusable bottles um, into the country. We um, explain to them that uh, the recycling systems are, mm, I cannot say, as we are, as, as, as in Germany, because in Germany, you know that, I mean, we select the rubbish, but then we send it away, you know, we don't recycle it ourselves, we just send it into developing countries. But um, I would say it's better to take your plastic out. But 
I can't tell our tour guides to look um, at the, you know, to tell the tourists you can leave, but please check me, let me check your luggage first. You know, or that's not possible. But we as, as, as a tour operator, as a hiking tour operator, we have a clientele which is very, very open to that question. So they say, thank you, thank you for reminding me. Um, with mass tourism or warm water tourism, that might be a different situation. But I have no idea how to solve this problem in the long run, except for making people a real bad conscious when they um, leave plastic in the destination. Um, can I say something maybe a bit controversial, but from somebody who comes from a seaside town that is inundated with tourists every year, um, every summer, um, and every hot Saturday or Sunday in August, tens of thousands of people come down from London to my hometown, Brighton, on the train, um, and pictures of the state of our beach and how much plastic rubbish is on it are shown, <laughs> shown on, on TV around the world after some of the, the big events that are held there. Fines. People shouldn't be allowed to just leave their litter behind. It's, it, uh, as somebody who is personally affected and whose destination, whose, whose hometown is personally affected, why should my taxes, why should you know, these ladies' taxes pay for the, for the mess that tourists leave behind? If there's somebody going up and down the beach or a team of people who are handing out on-the-spot fines, as they do for things like public drinking or you know, other, uh, uh, other antisocial behavior, I think people will start picking it up. Um, I, I'll just, I feel like I've been talking a lot, but I'll just say one more thing. It was really noticeable when, uh, when I was in Slovenia on holiday that the, um, the population there just have a tendency, whether it's from education, whether it's just, you know, very, just very green mentality, they don't drop litter in the same way as people in other countries. When I was young, there was a lot of education and there was a Keep Britain Tidy campaign that really, you know, schooled us in picking up litter. All of that funding has been cut. There's nothing like that now. And um, it's not just young people who drop the litter on the beach, um, but it tends to be people down from London having a party, not really, you know, thinking about the environment. Um, I think fines are the only way to stop them and, and to, to enact a policy. Okay, thank you, Rachel. I, I will raise one more question, which I just read here, because maybe this is nice to finalize, because we have to finish soon. Can the tourism industry become the first single-use plastics-free industry? That's a demanding question. It's possible, but it's a long way. And it, see, this this is uh, like like. Um, a red, a red line going through this day, um, it's a journey. But um, if we keep on trying and if we um, are the ones who say it's possible, you can do it, why don't you do it, then we will one day be really plastic free. It's a little bit um, a dream, but um, if we don't dream, nothing makes sense. We're such an interdependent industry interdependent on so many other sectors, particularly the, the food sector, that it, that makes it much more difficult. But it also means we have that influence. We have that influence to lobby for change. And, uh, and I think we should all really use our, our positions of influence as consumers and, and within our, our different organizations that we represent to encourage that change. I think um, also answering to, to this point is that the a first step could be that we have a goal that we don't have any more leakage into nature and the oceans of plastic waste. So if we establish a, a circular model so that we are able to, uh, to um, regulate the waste uh, in a way that it's, there's no, uh, it's not entering anymore to nature. It would, be a, it would be the most important step. And then we can reduce slowly, slowly uh, our, our way of life. But I think this is the most urgent thing that we, that we uh, yeah, avoid that uh, the waste comes into nature. Thank you. I think that was a nice final quote because we really have to stop now at 6.30. And... Um, we don't want to miss our dinner, 
I think that's most important to most of you because it has, a lot, has been a long day. But maybe dinner can be an opportunity for all of you to start your conversation. Maybe you're going to meet someone you want to partner with on your journey towards the reduction of single-use plastics. And I wish you good conversations. And foremost, I wish you all a very nice evening. And thanks for your interest in this panel session. See you later. So there we are, got to the end of this uh, first day of sessions. So buses will be outside to take you to the dinner place. It's a, about a 20 minute drive to uh, where we'll be having dinner. Just to remind you that tomorrow, transfers, just in case there's no opportunity to tell you this during dinner, tomorrow transfers will pick from